Okay, let's uh, get started. Today what we're going to talk about uh, strategic asset allocation. So if you recollect from um, the very first um, lecture, we talked about the different stages of asset allocation. And the very first, which actually we're not going to spend much time on in this course, I refer to as benchmark allocation. And that's simply indexing to a known benchmark. So if you want to track the S&P 500, there's many different ways to do that. It is, uh, in my opinion, rather mechanical exercise that doesn't take um, a lot of um, kind of strategic thought. If that's what you decide to do, that's fine. Second level of asset allocation is going to be what we refer to as strategic asset allocation. And strategic um, is a longer term asset allocation. It might be five years. In assignment number two, I pushed you to uh, even 10 years. Um, and what it involves is taking um, a calculated bet that deviates from sort of benchmark uh, weights. And we need to develop quantitative models to deal with that. And some of you already in assignment number um, two have uh, made some progress on that. And indeed, today we're going to talk about uh, assignment number two somewhat. Um, I was scrambling in my office as people were copying to the iDrive to try to read as many of them as possible before the lecture. And I took notes on about, I think, eight uh, of the turnips. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, I'm sure a few just were copied and I missed them. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about your forecasts of the S&P uh, 500 as a benchmark in terms of long-term um, strategic outlook. Um, the third level of asset allocation is what assignment number three deals with. And that's tactical asset allocation. Okay, so assignment number three, we will um, Actually, you should begin fairly soon on that one, because I know you thought assignment two took a long time, but <laughs> assignment number three, uh, that's where you're building forecasting models for your individual asset class returns. And that, it's not clear how long that's actually gonna take. So, and we have to be extremely careful when we do that. And I'll give you some tips right now. Hopefully everybody's looked at the research protocol that was required for uh, the first the lecture, it's kind of where we start. What I don't want to see, let me tell you what I don't want to see. And I know you've had some experience with this in other courses. What I don't want to see is, you know, ripping, um, you know, 300 data series from data stream and going one by one or in groups and trying to figure out which of those 300 does the best job of explaining next month's uh, stock return or bond return. Okay. I don't want to see anybody use uh, stepwise regression. And effectively, it's the same thing if you're just sitting there trying variable by variable late into the evening trying to get something to work. Okay. Because when it works, if you've you know, gone ahead and, and, and actually dredged the data like I'm suggesting, the probability that it's going to work out a sample is, is very low. So when you actually take your model and try to implement it in real time, put real money on it, it's probably going to fail. Because you have you've snooped the data, you've dredged the data, you've overfit your model, it looks good in sample, and it's not going to look good when you take it out of the, uh, the sample. It's usually the case. It is possible that you, you hit upon something that is real, but that's, not, um, that's probably not that likely. Indeed, if you really think about it, if you just randomly generated data to try to forecast a, a stock return, there's going to be some of those randomly generated series that are going to pass the <coughs> test of a T statistic greater than two. It's really not that much different when you're just sitting there um, you know, spinning um, the data source to try to get your best model. So be careful on that. Assignment number three is quite important um, in terms of uh, this course. 
Okay, so that's a bit of a warning uh, for assignment number three. And I'll talk more about assignment number three in D um, on Thursday. We'll talk about it then in some detail because I want to actually go through and talk about some variables that could be useful in forecasting uh, stock returns. Okay, the way to do this, as is detailed in the research protocol, is to sit down and think of the fundamental economic foundation of predictability. Choose a small set of variables. If, they, if some of them work, that's fine. If they don't work, that is also fine. That tells you something. Now, we also had experience with this in assignment number two. Because assignment number two was your first chance to develop a quantitative model that would predict stock returns. And the data that I gave you, that data um, sheet was, I don't know if you looked at the whole thing, but it had a lot of historical data in it. Look, going back to 1850s. So don't distribute that data to anybody. It took a long time to put that data uh, sheet together. But the idea there was that potentially you can develop a model over some of the data and test it uh, out of sample. Okay, so what do I want to do today? Today what I want to do is to talk about uh, strategic asset allocation in general and my views on strategic asset allocation. I want to kind of revisit some stuff that um, you've probably already done in terms of uh, simple mean variance type of analysis, but I want to push it to a different level. So it's possible you haven't really thought of mean variance analysis the way that I'm going to present it. And, um, and I think that it's, it's really important that we actually understand that. And then we're going to talk, I think, um, a fair bit about assignment number two, question number two, which is a really big deal. So there's a number of things in that assignment that were interesting. And um, I guess the question number two was probably my favorite, though question number one I'm sure took a lot longer to set up. But are you going to use the machinery in question number one or in assignment three and four? So it's time well spent. But in, a, in assignment number two, question number two, we talked about um, your view of long-term asset return over various horizons. And there was also a model that I threw in there for you to play with, uh, a fundamental valuation model. So the real questions, and they're highly um, relevant questions, is the, is the market today overvalued? That's what you get from the second part. And what is your view? If your view is that over the next five years that the S&P 500 is going to return 2% a year on average, then it's not real clear that you should have a lot of asset allocation to the S&P 500, right? Do much better with much lower volatility in fixed income. Short term. Okay, so these are like really uh, fundamental questions. Okay, for um, webcast students, what I've done is I emailed you uh, some of the slides that I'm going to use today. Today I'm actually not going to use the PowerPoint. I'm going to try hard copies on this digital uh, overhead to see if we can get uh, better resolution. And I've also posted some uh, PDF files on the iDrive for you. Um, and they're simple graphs. Some of you have actually already done these graphs in assignment number two, but um, a lot of you didn't actually do these graphs or I didn't see them. I couldn't look at all of the files. Um, I noticed some people had like six different Excel um, attachments and it was quite large. I, all I looked at were the, the write-ups and kind of scanned through uh, question number two. Okay, so let's, let's talk about um, strategic uh, asset allocation. Um, before we do that, are there any questions? I usually entertain questions at the beginning. Not right now. Okay. Um, so, so how do we get, like think about the exercise that we're actually doing to kind of start things off. Assignment number two, question number one. 
And this is often the way the asset allocation is presented in textbooks. So we take some average returns, we calculate uh, volatility variances and correlations that turns into a covariance matrix. And we kind of um, establish what the efficient frontier looks like. Okay, you've seen that many times as kind of standard uh, textbook material. And that's exactly uh, what we did in the first part. Okay, so um, I've, I've drawn up here standard um, mean variance uh, frontier where I've labeled this mean return on the y-axis and volatility on the x-axis. We've derived some sort of frontier. Indeed, many of you just set the volatility and figured out what the highest expected return portfolio was. But you could just reset the volatility, let um, solver calculate the weights, and you could trace the whole frontier. And some of you actually did that. I saw um, a whole frontier. Okay, we also know that the individual assets that you're considering are inside the frontier. And on average, people were looking at about five assets. Okay, so, so what we're doing is we are figuring out what the best combination of these assets are to maximize the expected return and to minimize the volatility. Or maybe more precisely, we set the volatility at some level and then we maximize the expected return. And we pick off a point on the frontier. So if our level of desired volatility is right here, which I think uh, I said, well, let's benchmark at the S&P 500 <coughs> volatility. I gave you a couple of benchmarks. Then this would be the portfolio that has the highest expected return for that level of volatility. OK, well, this is kind of standard. Had this for a long time. Markowitz. Uh, came up with this idea in the 50s, collected a uh, Nobel Prize on the way. Um, standard textbook material. How useful is this paradigm for what we really want to do? And that's like manage a lot of dough. What do you consider some of the issues involved here? The one you do think kind of beyond what we did in assignment number two. Assignment number two, at least the first question, was pretty mechanical. I did ask for some judgment a little later on in the question. It was pretty mechanical exercise. You need to be able to, to do that once, and you've done it. Okay, now what I want you to do is to think beyond the mechanics as to what kind of the economic foundation actually is. Does this framework make sense to be used in kind of a real asset allocation. What are the issues? So Jay, you are shaking your head, so. I just don't think it's going to take into account like when you have breakouts of, you know, oil, for example, has been historically trading in the team. And, you know, they're able to achieve this $30 price level long term. You know, total sectors and economies <coughs> changing. And I don't think this is, I mean, historically, it's not going to account for any breakout. Would never have predicted like, the internet revolution. Okay, okay, so there's uh, a number of things that you've mentioned that, that are relevant. Um, first thing, let's not confuse strategic with tactical. Okay, so strategic, let's take a three to five year horizon. And we know that there's going to be short term so called breakouts in, in certain things. So I'm interpreting what you're saying as kind of like, like a longer term breakout. Okay, so we're talking, let's say, three years. So it's unlikely, <coughs> let's say, over the next three years that we're going to see oil in the $10 range. Right? So how does that work in terms of uh, our actual asset allocation? Because we could have a commodities class that could be weighted towards oil, which usually is. And we could be using the historical data to figure out what the expected return is. And that might not be close to um, what the true expected return is, given the situation in the market. So I think that's 
that's real important. And that's indeed one of the reasons why I said, why don't we use some judgment in terms of these long-term asset class forecasts? Okay, so potentially um, we, can, we can fix this framework um, by using the longer-term forecasts. Or maybe fix is too strong. Um, we can perhaps make it perform a little better. Fix to me means that it's uh, fully operational and exactly what we should do. What are the other issues? Is that it? That we're just, um, our average returns could be incorrect? Yes. Well, are you talking about sort of if you want to put this into play? Absolutely. I mean, That's what this course is about, putting stuff sure, into play. Sure, well, this is not taking account of transactions costs or the sort of, it's going to, the opportunity cost of actually holding a very hugely diversified portfolio. I mean, you're not going to necessarily stay on that frontier if you start to, to chop those out. Okay, so two things. Um, one is transactions costs. And actually, the way I look at transactions costs, given that we're considering a strategic, sort of longer term horizon, I don't think that they're that significant because we've got kind of long term positions. If we're thinking of trading out every month or trading out every day, then transactions costs are hugely important. Now, it is also true that some markets, even with the longer term horizon, have large uh, transactions costs, like emerging markets. And that needs to be taken into account. And by transactions costs, let's be real clear here, um, I'm not just talking about the, the commission that you pay to buy uh, stock. There's many different um, levels of transactions costs. We have to take the bid-ask spread, obviously, into account. It's a real transactions cost. Okay. Now, the other thing you said was kind of interesting. You're going to be not necessarily on the frontier all the time. Um, you, I, I forget exactly the phrase you used, but bouncing around um, the frontier. What, what does it mean uh, to actually be on the frontier? So I put a dot up there um, that's on the frontier. And suppose that we uh, derive this frontier using the data that was available for assignment number two. We've got five asset classes. One of them is the US and let's say four other developed countries, UK, Germany, France, um, and one other country. All equity and we've optimized um, and we've got a portfolio uh, on that frontier. We've used returns from 1970 to December 2000 to generate um, the, the average returns, the volatility, and the correlations. So what does that point mean, right? Well, it's optimized for that particular point in time. And if you're focusing on the long term, as an allocation perspective, there's a need to constantly rebalance <coughs> the portfolio to find the optimal optimal weighting so that you stay on the efficient front frontier, which ties in, I guess, with transaction costs, but just it's not realistic that you can constantly stay on the frontier unless you're constantly rebalancing. And it also depends upon what data, historical data you use to derive your volatility measure. For example, if you use the last 20 years, you're going to have a different you know, picture than someone who's using the last 50 years. And as you add data, that will change as well. So it's sort of the rebalancing issues. OK. Let's, for, for the discussion um, today, let's assume that transactions costs are not going to be a big deal. Indeed, um, I, given the choice of equities, we could be using like some rolling future strategy or some index fund approach that um, would really minimize the transactions costs. But the thing that's really critical for us to address is whether it is possible to actually ever achieve this frontier. So you're saying, you're talking about staying on the frontier. Like I want to really know what that means. Prakash? The exposed uh returns may not match ex ante expectations. So uh, you are moving away from uh, your target allocation in time as you proceed. And uh, so that basically means you have to readjust to the new expectations you have uh, based on what you, you know, 
recently realized. Okay. On the second, on the second frame, you also see some uh, some uh, blips, you know, of either technology or productivity or wars or whatever, or expectations of the war, which changes um, in time. So you have to continually adjust to that. Okay, well let's suppose that we are continually readjusting. And let's say we run this maybe on a quarterly basis for strategic asset allocation. It's unlikely that we're gonna be recalibrating every month. It's more for the tactical. Let's say we're continually uh, reassessing. Um, but the key thing that you mentioned here is that this is based upon the ex post data. It's stuff that's already happened, right? And really what we care about is the ex ante data stuff that's going to happen, or at least that's expected to happen in the future. Right? So there's a disconnect. right? And we could be um, recalibrating our model you know, as the new data comes in. But even when we do that, we're fitting ex post. Okay? And this represents ex post. Yes? Yeah, I don't know if this is going to add a lot to it, but I mean, that Okay, does everybody see that? that it, it, it actually is not uh, a redundant point. It is a very important point. Okay? The only way that this is going to work exactly to be on the frontier is if what we've actually developed ex post is exactly realized in the future. Now, Hopefully, um, though maybe you haven't done this exercise explicitly, you will be doing this exercise uh, in the tactical assignment, assignment three. You've done part of this exercise <coughs> in um, assignment number two in forecasting kind of long-term returns for the S&P 500. And I think you've realized already that it's extremely unlikely that your, forecast, uh, your forecasting model is going to deliver 100% R-square. Extremely unlikely. If it does, then there's a real problem. Right? In, indeed, um, when the R-square is really high, that's probably bad news because you made a mistake in formulating your model. Okay, so it's real clear, it's difficult to predict equity returns over the short horizon and even the longer horizon. We'll get a little more uh, power in the longer horizon uh, with some uh, mean reversion, but uh, extremely difficult. Okay. So the ex post is not going to match the ex ante. So what are we left with? We need to somehow interpret this. Indeed, as I said, this is kind of a textbook approach here. And it might not be uh, 30 years of data that we're using. Maybe we're using the last five years of data to try to put the weight on the most recent data. And some people actually do other things, like um, uh, exponentially weight. So you've got exponentially weighted moving average that uh, weights the most recent data more than the data uh, in the past. And again, you just get uh, a mean out of that. Does everybody see that? The average returns that you were using put an equal weight on every single observation from 1970 to 2000. An exponentially weighted average would have the largest weights with the recent data and it would decay and put very little weight on the older data. Does that make any difference in terms of what we're doing? Not really because it's just the representation of the past. It might be that the exponentially weighted average is somewhat more indicative of the future than just the overall average, but it's basically the same story. It's an ex post measure. Yes? Instead of using the lagged time variable, like uh, using that uh, 97 to 99, 2000 data, can you actually stay on a point of time and use the forecasted or front time variable to see what, you know, like now you have the real data 
and what would explain uh, at that point of time the, the future uh, realized returns? Can something be done to you know, like give you an idea of what are important variables, what were the important variables at that point of time going forward, and, and do some uh, data filling to see or, but, but isn't that effectively what we began to play with in assignment number two, where we're, we're only looking at one asset class because I had lots of historical data on it, but we're looking at the interaction between a dividend yield measure, um, a yield curve measure, and uh, a credit spread, and how that affected um, the, uh, the returns on the S&P. So you know, I, th I think that basically where you're going is saying, well, uh, Instead of running the uh, Markowitz optimization on the average returns, the average volatility, the average correlation, why don't we run it directly on the outputs from our quantitative forecasting models? And that's exactly what you should do. Okay, given your best forecast, what are the weights that, um, that are, are optimal? given that forecast and given my choice of risk. What we've got here in terms of, you know, kind of what you've done in assignment number two is an ex post uh, exercise. Let me push it a little further just so you really, um, really kind of see what's going on. Okay, what we've done Let's say we've got data from 1970 to 2000, the five asset classes that I mentioned. Okay. And we've figured our level of volatility. We've optimized. And, and we have um, figured out the portfolio that delivers the highest expected return for that level of risk. So the question is, okay, and this is given that I know the data. Okay, so from 1970 to 2000, got the data, I optimize, and ex post, this is the best portfolio. Question. If I start in 1970 as an asset manager, and I am restricted to these five asset classes. <coughs> where do you think, um, where do you think I could perform? For example, am I gonna be inside the frontier or am I going to be outside the frontier? More particularly, I'm going from 1970, I don't have the knowledge of the data in the future start to manage your portfolio, and the question is, am I going to be inside always, or is it possible to be outside the frontier? Yes? It's possible to be outside. It's you, possible to be outside. Because the, the real returns could be higher than the, the average. Uh, the real returns? Asset. So you're saying the real average return could be greater than the average return? Than the expected one. This is just the average. So all I've done is taken data from 1970 to 2000. Okay, and we've got average returns for the S&P 500, average returns for um, portfolios in the UK, France, Germany, and let's say Spain. And, and the frontier is uh, calculated when you, when you calculated the weights. So based on the expected returns? It's based purely upon the data that I feed into it, the actual data. So it's like, um, suppose that uh, I was in 1970 and I knew the future out to 2000. Exactly what happens. So it's not expected And it optimized. These are just the ex post average returns. You know, it, it, you know, again, it's the difference between ex post and ex ante. This is just the data, it's the average. It's not necessarily the forecast the average. So the question to you, is it possible using the same asset classes, the same constraints that you've got, is it possible for that asset manager in 1970 
to achieve the frontier? Is that possible? Yes, Jim. I think you can go above or below the frontier in any year in between 1970 and 2000, but by the year 2000, you're going to be on the frontier. Be on the frontier. You would, you would be exactly on the frontier because all the data you had feeding into your model were, were accurate. But the thing is, to get that frontier, you need to know what's going to happen in the future. And that's right? what you said we knew. No, no, no. When oh, I I'm did right. the frontier, let me rephrase that. the question. Okay. When I drew the frontier, you know, it, it, let's call this, um, I, I sometimes refer to this to, as the kind of oracle portfolio. Okay, so you're looking at the oracle, and the oracle is telling you what the average return is going to be in these five asset classes, the exact volatility, and the correlation. Take those inputs into your uh, assignment number two, uh, mean variance optimizer. Okay, and it tells me this is the optimal weights. Okay, and, and, and that's what I implement. So you've got the oracle, that's one thing. Now, what I'm asking is, now just take the, the average asset manager. Does not have the information of the future. Just says what's available in, if you start in January uh, 1970, whatever's available in, in December 1969. Okay. And yeah, they'll learn through time and, uh, and maybe uh, update. But is it possible for that manager to achieve the frontier? given they don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I Pierre. I think it's possible to achieve the frontier if they are very lucky. Yes. But I don't think they can go above the frontier. OK. So I, I, I think that uh, the first part is correct, that there is a chance, amazing luck, um, that you actually get it right in 1970. OK. Is, is that you know the probability associated with that is, is minuscule, right? Okay, so it is measure zero. There is a chance. But the second part you say, but there's, but that's it. That's the maximum that you can do. If you want to go on the frontier sometimes, you have to short sell some securities. No, let, let, let's say we were operating under the same constraints. And I didn't actually specify if there's like no short selling allowed, but we can, whatever the constraints are, just identical for this frontier and the asset manager. By definition, though. Frontier, it's the maximum return, expected return you can expect for a specified level of risk. Right. So, if by definition, it's the maximum. You can increase your return, but in this case, you take more risk. Mm -hmm. So, for a given level of risk, I don't think. For a given level of risk. Yes. Okay, so is, is that clear? That's kind of like what you learned in, um, in the <coughs> first course, right? You've seen this stuff before. So, that's real clear? Okay, that we can achieve the frontier uh, with just luck. That's it. Okay, so you kind of think, well, what does that mean for performance evaluation? You don't want to be measured against the frontier, right? It's not really fair. Right. Let's see, a few people are kind of like, is he tricking us or something? <laughs> Aren't you really just saying it's sort of a it's a timeline? It's like Back to the Future. Yeah. I mean, if I could go back 30 years and know if I could figure this out now and knew the portfolio I would have to get, you know, these equal, whatever the weightings were on five individual asset classes, and then went back to 1970 and chose them, that would that would simply have to be because I knew what they were going to be. And and that's what this represents, right? Okay. Yes. Could you explain again why you can't be? over the frontier because at least this is from what I, I got from it. If the returns that you get are higher than you had expected. No, but this has nothing to do with expectations. This, is, this has to do with the actual data that's realized. We're, look, it, it, back to the future is a good analogy. You know exactly what's going to happen, right, for, for the oracle. The oracle delivers this. You get this frontier. You get these weights. But if you're just a regular person in 1970, you, you have no idea of what's going to happen. Yes? My question is kind of close to what you were just asking. If you calculate the frontier for a portfolio, that means that you have some outperformers and underperformers in terms of volatility, but for the same uh, level of volatility, you can have 
lower or higher uh, return than uh, the frontier tells you. So if if you again by by mere chance you invest in the outperformers, so for the same level of volatility you will get the return which is above the, the uh, return of the frontier, which means that you are ending up outside of the frontier. Okay, let's actually go to the graph um, and. Uh, suppose that you look at these five <coughs> asset classes and notice that these two have higher return. And suppose that you took a portfolio, those are the outperformers. Suppose you, instead of um, trying to hit uh, with all five assets, put zero weight on three of the assets and simply put your weight <coughs> on those two assets. Okay, just given the diagram that I've got here, is there any chance of exceeding the, uh, the frontier with those? John? What well, you have there is average data though, so I think what Igor might be saying is each year there's, there, some of these points are above or below where they normally would be and the average out would be a certain spot. So if your portfolio manager guesses correctly every year which ones are gonna be outperforming where they do on average, and could you could you get there as a whole? The years that you would underperform, you just don't weight that that asset class. And the years you would overperform, you would weight it. So you you actually would beat your average uh, across time. That's what you're referring to. Good. That's exactly correct. Okay. So um, kind of lesson number one in strategic asset allocation is that um, we can achieve performance above the frontier. Okay, and basically what you're talking about is using some sort of dynamic strategy where your weights are changing through time. Okay, can that beat what I've drawn? Yes. Okay, let me go into it a little more detail so you see what's going on here. So I think that's what you're trying to get at too, right? Um, so it's very much related. Um, this portfolio, this point right here, Describe the trading strategy from 1970 to 2000, December 2000. We get a set of weights when we optimize. Let's, let's keep it simple. Suppose the weights are 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and 0.2, equally weighted. It just, the chance of that also is pretty uh, extreme, but suppose that pops out uh, for our level of volatility. Describe the portfolio strategy uh, to achieve that point on the efficient frontier. What do we do? Okay, so again, suppose you look at the oracle, it tells you the information, it delivers the weights, and then we have to implement the weights. Yes, you John? You buy them in 1970 and just hold them for the 30 years. Buy and hold. Simple. No information. Yeah, well, actually, we've got great information. We've got perfect information, but, that, but that's it. Buy and hold. Yes? Did you maintain that fixed weighting from the period? Ah, is that buy and hold? No, it's not buy and hold. Buy and hold, what happens if, uh, if one asset does better than another asset? What happens to the weights? Yes? Right. Exactly. So the buy and hold is, uh, is definitely not going to work in terms of getting that point. Because we know that the asset classes will perform differently. Okay, we know that for sure given we've seen the oracle. So it's not a buy and hold. Yes, Jay? You're not in a strategic or in a tactical investment. Uh, yeah, you could look at it that way. So is it not possible to achieve returns in excess of the efficient frontier on a strategic but only tactically investing? Uh, what we're talking about is actually using a dynamic strategy, which you could call tactical, which we will call tactical. And what we're going to do is we're going to achieve performance above that efficient frontier. But okay. you can't do it strategically by just buying and holding. No buying and hold. Well, let's let's 
Let's save that. You know, buy and hold I want to return to. Okay? okay. One thing is real clear that this is not a buy and hold strategy. Right? Okay, it is a, a strategy that demands rebalancing. Now, what kind of strategy is this? You, you talked about the actual mechanics of it. Well, it's dynamic. The question is how often do you rebalance? Because it could be daily, it could be hourly. I mean, that's when you get into trouble. That's when actually transaction costs would affect. You're correct. OK. Um, so, and again, let's, let's make it easy. We're going to be dynamically doing futures, and the transaction costs are, are minimal. Okay. And let's say we rebalance every month which is close enough, let's say. What, how would you characterize that strategy? You've already <coughs> said it in words, but there's kind of like terminology for it. So, you're, so if one stock performs, or one asset class performs better than another, you sell that, and then the one that performed it's worse. It's contrary. Sell winners. Sell winners by losers. Okay, so the mean variance optimal strategy based upon the ex post data implies an equally, well, a, a, what I refer to as a fixed weight strategy. Fixed weight from 1970 to 2000, where you're rebalancing, and the rebalancing is by definition, a contrarian rebalance. There was another question over here. Okay. So is it possible uh, to achieve a position above the frontier? The answer is yes. Because what we're going to do is to tactically or dynamically change the weight. So we're not going to be held. And if you really think about it, it is a pretty significant constraint that we've imposed. That the weights have to be the same every single period. And we can achieve performance outside this frontier by dynamically altering the weights through time. Yes? This is purely a constraint of, um, of the way that this is usually presented. Okay? It, it is, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is you learn Markowitz optimization in your standard uh, finance course. And people know how to do it, now you know how to implement it. But I want you to understand what it's really about and see its limitations. I thought it was like uh, the weights that are assigned to the asset class are picked up in the beginning of the period and then they disappear in the 30 years. And they disappear in the 30 years. They pick up this weights at the beginning of that course, beginning of the 30 year period. Yeah, uh, you're not going to have exactly the same um, weights for every single asset class, but your overall performance and volatility are going to be exactly what are predicted. Well, but this, this particular model imposes the assumption <coughs> that every single month, because we use monthly data to calibrate this, right? every single month the weights are, in my example, 0.2. That, that's just it. That's just the way this particular model works. Okay. Fixed weights. So we're using this, and if we're using this for strategic asset allocation or, or whatever, you need to understand that the weights are fixed in this analysis. And it's, it's easy to visualize a methodology um, where you could achieve better than um, the kind of Markowitz optimization. Think about, make it even simpler. Suppose you've got two asset classes, cash and the S&P 500. Okay, and you can think of the average return of the S&P 500, and you can think of the average return on cash. And you could uh, draw a frontier between those two points. And then think of the possible return that you could get if every time the S&P was positive, you were 100% in the S&P. 
and every time it was negative, you're 100% in cash. If you were allowed to have a dynamic strategy like that, you could easily achieve performance above the frontier between those two points. Okay? And because you're in cash many of the times, the volatility is going to be a fraction of the S&P 500. So you can achieve, with lower volatility, a return above the S&P 500. So that's, that's real important. So let me um, take back some of the words um, that I said. Remember I said for performance evaluation, you never want to be ben benchmarked against the efficient frontier. Well, actually, if you've got dynamic trading strategies going on, you don't necessarily care about that. Actually, you'd like to be benchmarked against something that is inefficient as possible. And inefficient here means, to me, as beatable as possible. So I said, uh, I think in, in the first uh, lecture, we'd love to be benchmarked against the, the cap M, because it, it's obvious that we can you know, have neutral market risk and load up on other risks, and over the longer term, outperform. The cap M is a naive model for performance evaluation. This is a naive model. It assumes that the weights are constant every single month. It's naive because nobody really has a portfolio like that. Nobody's going to do that. Okay, so, so really, you know, this is our, our starting point to, to kind of understand this that this represents a fixed weight strategy. And sometimes it's referred to, and you'll see in my uh, articles on the reading list, I'll call this an unconditional strategy. It's unconditional because it doesn't really use any information available today. I'm sitting in January 2001, and I want to develop a portfolio for the next five years. And the only thing that's going into my model <coughs> in this analysis is the average return, the average volatility, the average correlation. And every observation is weighted equally from January 1970 to December 2000. Just treat everything the same. I am not using the fundamental information that's available at the end of December 2000. The state of the economy today. That's not going into the model. I'm just using the averages. That's why I call it unconditional. If it was conditional, it would be a conditional forecast based upon the state of the economy today. Use conditioning information to forecast ahead. And you were doing some of this in question number two. So OK, well, we've got some historical data. There's a relation between the term structure, the uh, credit spread, dividend yield. Let's fit a model and to actually implement that model. To implement that model, we use the data that's available today. And today for us is the end of December 2000. We put that data into our model and we get an out of sample forecast looking forward. That is a conditional forecast. Another way of looking at this, um, conditional versus unconditional, it might be a little confusing to pitch it this way, but let's try to think of it um, in terms of a regression model. So I'm forecasting the US uh, equity return. And suppose I run a very odd regression model where the only thing in my model is the intercept. <laughs> So I'm just regressing on the intercept. There's no other variables in the model. Uh, what is the coefficient in this regression on the intercept? Igor? It's going to be the average return. The average return. Exactly the average return. What is the R squared of this regression? Another way of thinking about this is 
let's, uh, let's, let's actually um, see if I can do this in reverse. Um, think of graphing through time the S&P 500 return. Okay, so we've got a graph through time. It, uh, it's going like this all over the place, right? Remember, the R squared is telling us how closely we're matching the peaks and troughs, matching the variances. So if we're exactly matching, it's 100% R squared. R squared is just the ratio of the variance of what we're predicting to the variance of our fitted values, our forecasted values. What, are, what do our predicted values look like? Straight line. Is the variance of straight line? Zero. Ratio of zero to something is zero. R square, zero. So the unconditional framework, which is kind of like the foundation here um, for this exercise, for the original Markowitz uh, optimization, the unconditional framework is using a forecasting model. And you're going to be building these models in, in assignment number three. It's using a forecasting model that has got an R squared of zero. Okay, so beware here. Because when you get out and actually start doing asset management, you're going to see situations where people are doing strategic asset allocation and they will assume the inputs for the strategic asset allocation are the average returns, the average volatilities, and the average correlations over some previous sample. The thing for you to remember here is that that model has got an R squared of zero. Now, maybe it is the case that it's really impossible to forecast a particular asset class. There's just no way. I can't specify the economic model. The, um, the econometrics don't work. I just get a zero R squared, no matter how hard I try. Not snooping the data, but using a scientific approach. Fine. If I can't forecast that, then maybe I should just say, well, I can't forecast this, so therefore, I'm going to use the historical average. That's a case to use it. But to simply assume that the average return is the forecasted return, to me, is problematic. You've got to give the quantitative models a chance, at least. And it was actually interesting in your assignment number two, at least, that some of the variables appear to have some power to predict the longer term returns. So I think, personally, it's really important to avoid using average returns in an asset allocation framework. Because it's like you're throwing up your arms and saying, the R squared is zero, end of story. I want, well, and maybe I'm biased on this a bit because all of my research suggests that the R squared is not zero. <coughs> so I've got like a real strong prior belief that that is the wrong assumption to make. So I think that it's safe to say we don't want to use the average here. Okay, there's, there's other stuff going on here that you need to be aware of. Uh, yeah, first Prakash. In uh, measuring, in using the average, there is some thought that's going in that uh, the returns are random. And you, you're better off using an average than picking up a point based on your future expectations. Because you may see economy in certain state, but it can come out of it tomorrow, or it can come out of it, you know, it may go deeper tomorrow. So what, what's happening tomorrow uh, over in three months' time may not be you know, as clear as you might like to believe. At, you know, I think it's so a, it's what a, point do you take? Sure, it's you a great point that you're making. Point, yeah. Or what is right. your belief about today? So you need, to, um, you need to be smart about this. Right? If you believe that um, the stock returns are so-called white noise process, just the same as something that would be generated from uh, you know, uh, a random number generator. 
which is not exactly white noise, by the way. Um, you're completely unpredictable. Okay, if you believe that, that, that's fine. Then you're going to use this longer term average to try to pick things up. But for me personally, I kind of see that stocks are related to a number of things um, that make sense in some sort of economic model in the economy. I believe that the movement in stock returns is to some small degree, and the keyword here is small, some small degree has some predictability, especially over the long term. And what I want to do is to capture that small degree. And if I do, if I can capture that, then I'm going to look really good as an asset manager. And it's going to be some work to get it, but we need to try. And if we don't achieve for a particular asset you know, solid evidence of predictability, then let's go back to the base case, which is using a longer term average. Yes? Is there also a problem in this model in the sense that uh, the correlations were also assuming that those are constant through time and in fact they may be very different at different points in time? Right, just look at the, um, the graphs that I showed you in the first lecture. Right? Does correlation depend upon the stage of the business cycle? Absolutely. Does volatility depend upon the stage of the business cycle? And that's only one way to cut the data. Right? Well, I guess I cut the data twice. One by the business cycle, where I said that wasn't really predictable because we don't know when the official peaks and troughs are until after the fact. But then we cut the data by the term structure, positive or negative slope, and there was a huge difference between returns, volatilities, and correlations. So good point. Um, we've got more than expected returns going in here. We've got volatility and correlations. And they can change also. So volatility and correlations changing, that will, will definitely change the picture. Now we're going to do all of this. Uh, indeed, the lecture that we talk about volatility modeling, we'll have Tim Bolerslev here give his view. And he's like the world expert on volatility. Um, but maybe not to preempt him uh, too much, um, I, I think that it's safe to say, and people doing asset allocation would agree, the most important input for successful asset allocation is to get the expected return right. Volatility and correlation are important but of second order importance. Get the performance right. OK, there's two other ideas that we need to cover. And um, we're not going to be able to cover them in, in two minutes before our break. We'll return to, to one of them after the break. Um, the, the first one is there is an idea that you should be familiar with um, in terms of um, an idea of, of asset allocation that um, is due to uh, the late Fisher Black and uh, Bob Litterman at Goldman Sachs. And they're able to extract kind of longer term what they consider equilibrium returns in the following exercise. Assume that the volatilities and the correlations are not changing that much over time. So assume for the long term that our estimate from 1970 to 2000 is a pretty decent estimate for going forward. It's actually, you know, there's evidence to support the volatility is very persistent. And correlations really looking over very long horizons. So let's assume that we've got the volatilities exactly. And let's assume we've got the correlations exactly. And remember, while correlations might shift with the business cycle, we're looking at a longer horizon. Now, their idea is the following. Let's observe in the market the capitalization of various different asset classes. And let's figure out what the market weights are for different asset classes. So for our example of five countries' equity markets, well, we know the capitalizations of those five countries. And we can observe the market weights. And now let's go to the, uh, back to the, uh, the market weights optimization. Okay, remember what you did 
was you fed it the expected returns, the volatilities, and the correlations. It delivered weights. What do you think Black and Letterman are going to do? They've got the volatility, the correlations, and they've got observed market weights. What are they going to do? Solve for the expected returns. So assuming people agree upon the volatility and the correlations, and assuming some level of rationality where people have kind of solved this problem, so that people have their own sense of what the expected return is, people have solved the problem, <coughs> here are the weights. Well, what I'm going to do as an econometrician is observe the weights, the volatility, and the correlations, and solve for expected returns. And they call that the equilibrium, e equilibrium return. So that's the so-called black Litterman type of approach. It's a little more complex, and there are um, PDF files on the syllabus where you can explore that in greater detail. But that's, uh, in my opinion, kind of a cool idea. It gives us another benchmark for the expected returns. So what are people assuming over the longer term? There's going to be a lot of issues with that um, as to why that might not be the real expected return. <laughs> And I'll just throw a few in, like maybe the correlation and the volatility aren't the true expected correlation and volatility. It assumes a level of rationality that we'll assume in this course, but might not actually be held up in the data. Uh, it assumes that people only care about, uh, expect, uh, about expected return and variance. Um, so there's no other higher moments going on. It assumes kind of this whole strategic framework. There's no room for dynamic trading strategies. Well, this is uh, an interesting approach, and the, uh, the information is there for you to take a look at. We're not really going to focus on that style uh, of asset allocation in this course. Okay, so let's kind of pick up. The, the last thing that I need to do is to figure out where the risk-free rate fits in in this frontier. Okay, I know you've seen that before, but again, I'm going to challenge you to think about um, the interpretation. And then we'll talk about our view of uh, stock returns in the U.S. over the next five to ten years. Okay, let's take a 15-minute break. Good question at the at the break. The relationship between assignment two, three, and four <laughs> in assignment number one. It is possible that you could use some of the stuff that you learned in two, three, and four in assignment number one, but not necessarily. So assignment one, the idea is for you to choose something that you're interested in and to research it in a lot of detail. Maybe use some of the tools from this course. Hopefully, use some of the tools from this course. Um, and then do uh, a presentation to the class in, in the last lecture, okay? And please send me uh, an email as to, uh, at least if we don't meet directly, about your idea for assignment number one. And I think I've got most of the groups posted on the internet now. If you check your email, um, I, I think I've got eight uh, posted right now um, in all the links, um, so, so that's kind of, Update me in terms of uh, your project and, and things like that. Okay, uh, any other issues? Okay, let's kind of return to where we were. Just want to, uh, I'm going to be saying the same thing many different times. So at the break, some people said, well, I'm not 100% sure, percent sure I, I get this exactly. Well, remember I told you, I think the first lecture took me like five years after my PhD to figure a lot of this stuff out. So I surely don't expect you to you know, snap the fingers after one hour listening to me. Okay? It doesn't work like that. Okay? But it is important to get this straight. Okay? I want to do two more things before we actually uh, take a look at um, 
some data. The first thing that I would like to do is just to kind of review what we talked about in the first part. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to sketch here is an obvious limitation of the traditional implementation of the Markowitz optimization. The way that you implemented this forces the weights in the asset classes to be the same. Okay, my simple example, we got five asset classes and suppose they were equal weights. And that point on the frontier is just representing equal weights through time. So the way to achieve that frontier is uh, in January 1970, maybe you could get just incredibly lucky and guess that those are the, the optimal weights and you just rebalance every single period to make sure you've got 0.2 in each of those five asset classes. And then you will exactly achieve that point on the frontier. Okay. It's unrealistic to think that somebody's actually got the knowledge of 31 years of data to do the optimization to figure out what those weights are. That's just not possible. Okay. Now the second point that I made was that given that we're imposing a strong constraint that the asset weights are exactly equal and that the asset weights are fixed through time, that it is possible to achieve performance above the frontier if we allow for dynamic weight changes, if we allow for dynamic strategy. One particular simple strategy is to mix in some sort of buy and hold strategies. So that's a possibility. And buy and hold strategy is not a fixed weight strategy, though it is very mechanical. Just basically um, what happens is that the weight increases for securities that do really well, or asset classes that do real well. Buy and hold strategies are not included in this representation of the frontier. Okay, so what the traditional optimization does is to deliver fixed weight rather than variable weight strategies. And I actually suggested, if you go back um, and, and take a look, one simple way to see this, if we had just two assets. And this is the average S&P, or whatever benchmark. And then we've got um, some sort of risk-free. Over the same period, what does the frontier look like? Line. Okay, um, and this represents a buy and hold of the S&P 500. This represents just rolling cash. Okay, is it possible to be outside the <laughs> frontier? And I would argue, yes it is. If you've got a forecasting model for the S&P and it helps you get out of situations where the S&P is negative, then it is possible to achieve a return up here with higher average returns than the S&P 500 and lower volatility. Okay. The difference here is that along this frontier, all of the weights are fixed. Up here, the weights must be dynamic. That's the only way that you can get this combination. So you're in the market in times where it's really going up and you're out of the market when it's going down. Not all the time, but some of the time and your forecast is reasonably accurate, um, you can achieve performance with dynamic strategies above the frontier. And that's exactly where we're going, okay? Dynamic trading strategies, tactical asset allocation, kind of the same thing, okay? So, um, so that's kind of important. So let's go back to the traditional mean variance diagram. There's one more thing that we need to uh, consider. And that is, how does the, the so-called risk-free rate 
come into play here. I already drew it in the, in the um, previous diagram. So, so what do you do with the risk-free rate? Just what I did, right? Yes? Um, in, indeed, <laughs> uh, but you might run into the following problem. If the risk-free rate is, let's say, right here, you see what that problem might be? When you lever up, you could get an inefficient um, portfolio, right? So you could be better with a tangency portfolio. Right. Okay. And then lever up or lever down to match your whatever expected or desired possibility in order to Okay. So it's kind of standard analysis, right? I've seen all that uh, before. Again, we're doing um, strategic asset allocation. So when you introduce the risk-free rate, and this is from the textbook and from uh, 350, you introduce the risk-free rate, we get a tangency portfolio <coughs> that's the, the best possible trade-off of expected return and volatility. And then for a desired level of volatility or a desired utility, doesn't matter uh, the way you pitch this, then we can actually uh, lever up or lever down to get that level of volatility. Indeed, in this particular example I showed you, we're made better off with the risk-free rate. Right? Okay. Um, so not to take you on uh, a tangent, um, excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> This analysis is <coughs> problematic. I know it's the standard stuff, and sometimes students get angry because, gee, I was taught all this in the intro finance or in investments, and now you're telling me that there's something wrong with this analysis. <coughs> well, it's the story of this course, really. And look at it positively. It's better that you know that there's something wrong with it, and everybody else doesn't. So think about the exercise here. Uh, we are, and again, this is a standard diagram from, from whatever textbook. We can put some numbers on here uh, if we want. Um, 31 years of data. Yes? No surprise. In this type of analysis, when you introduce a risk-free, the so-called risk-free rate, it's almost always assumed to have a zero volatility. And you just kind of connect the line to the tangency frontier. <coughs> now, from 1970 to December 2000, the short-term interest rate was hardly um, you know, zero volatility, especially 1979 to 1981. Short term rate goes to like 20%. Okay. The way this is usually implemented is people are thinking about a strategy whereby you're rolling over short term. And the rolling of short term does not have zero volatility. Okay. That hopefully is real clear. The other thing that's implicitly assumed here is something about the correlation between the risk-free <coughs> and um, our, our equity portfolios. 
what is the assumed correlation in this framework between the equity portfolio, the tangency portfolio, and the risk free? Somebody said, I heard a quiet voice say zero. Yeah, it's just something with no volatility, it can hardly be correlated. Just think of the definition of correlation. So, so basically what happens is you've made the strong assumption about volatility, a strong assumption about correlation. What is the correlation empirically between the short-term interest rate and equity returns? Like, I'm not asking you to do a regression in your head, just think about economically the, uh, the relationship. Negative. Negative, yeah. Rates go up, that's bad news. Rates go down, that's good news, almost always. It's a negative correlation between equity returns and uh, in interest rates. Let me just aside on that just for a minute. It's kind of obvious why, because you're discounting the cash flows by an interest rate plus some risk premium. The other thing that you should note is the interest rate is very persistent, very slow moving through time, with some exceptions, 1979 to 1981, but it's very slow moving. And if it's the case that that's related to stock returns, then there could be some bite in actually using interest rate measures to forecast stock returns. And that's what you're going to be doing in assignment number three. Okay. So, so one thing <coughs> is real clear. Within this framework, we can't do this. Yes? Can you use your whatever time frame you're uh, investing for? If you uh, take up a bond or a table and hold it to maturity, you're not exposed to any volatility. That's correct. So the way the around this, there are two <coughs> ways around it. Okay, the first way is to somehow secure, in January 1970, to secure a zero coupon 31 year bond and hold it to maturity. Okay? We know what the return is going to be exactly. Okay? And, and we're done. So if we want to do that and make all sorts of tax assumptions and, and, and stuff like that, you know, fine. If you want to match, but usually the way this is presented is with a short maturity sort of bond, a T-bill, something like that. And the T-bill necessitates a rolling strategy uh, over this uh, period. So, so really what we need to do, and, and how do we solve um, this problem of the short term uh, money market, T-bill sort of thing, having volatility and correlation. We want to add it to our asset allocation framework. What do we have to do? We want to use Markowitz kind of optimization. What do we do? We're not going to be drawing this line, right? Yeah. Just throw it in the as one of the ad, uh, asset classes? Throw it in. It's an asset. Fine. Okay, so just re-optimize without, you know, instead of having five assets, you have six. Now you'll notice that the frontier is going to move a lot closer um, to the zero vol because it turns out that the short-term interest rate volatility is pretty small compared to equities. But you're not going to get a straight line. Now it's actually interesting if you want to do this exercise. If you added a sixth asset to your assignment number two optimizers and you stuck in uh, some sort of expected return, which is fixed for uh, the T-bill, and stuck in zero volatility and zero covariances, and then solve for different levels of volatility, what's the frontier going to look like? Straight line. Exactly. But as soon as you put a volatility in, in correlations, you're going to get the curve. So that's kind of like the second thing that we really need to be aware of. What happens with the risk-free? The risk-free is a big deal um, in terms of asset allocation. There's always an allocation to cash. But don't make the mistake of assuming that it's got zero volatility. And go through this tangency analysis, which, um, so um, it's really 
not clear that we're going to be holding that one particular portfolio here. So this analysis says, hold this portfolio and lever it up to get this expected return. It's not clear that's the correct thing to do. Well, actually, I think it is the incorrect thing to do. What we need to do is to take the risk-free, add it to the asset allocation optimization, recalculate the frontier, and then given our level of volatility, choose the portfolio that's optimal. <coughs> Assuming fixed weights, yes. We actually looked at that, and it seemed to be that I mean we had a, we had a huge weight on the risk free. It mean, you know, tended to be a large chunk. Correct. Eighty nine percent. Yeah, I mean it tended to be a big thing. Wasn't that? Is it basically that you're taking your efficient frontier as is and just simply taking away the straight line and moving left? Yeah, basically you are. Uh, it changes the shape, mm -hmm. and but it definitely moves to the left, marches to the left big time. Does that in any way correspond to the part of the straight line from risk free that's to the tendency point? No. It's not on that line. Okay. Yeah. But it could be close. And indeed, the lower the volatility gets, uh, the more close that curve will approach that line. Okay? Again, this is all fixed weight stuff. Okay? And and really the bottom line here is this is like you need to know this stuff. But in actual implementation, you're not going to be doing this. Okay, because we're going to want dynamic trading strategies. Okay, but for this, and, and even for the, the strategic sort of uh, outlook, um, we're going to be feeding our optimizer, we're going to be feeding it forecasts of all the asset classes, including a forecast of the risk free and how it co varies with uh, the other assets. Okay, and then we're going to be saying, well, here are some average weights that as kind of a benchmark to start with. Okay, so you see how it's going to work? We establish what our benchmark is. And maybe it's the Morgan Stanley Capital International world. We're 100% equity. Then we take the individual asset classes and put our best guess on those asset classes for the expected returns. And it might be that we use the historical volatilities and covariances. We, we do some sort of optimization and set the optimization equal to the volatility of the Morgan Stanley Capital International World Portfolio. And then take a look at the weights. And it's going to give us some information about over and underweighting certain asset classes, certain countries. And that's kind of a starting point for us. And then we're going to have to determine how much of a deviation we're willing to take. If it says go 8% into cash, um, then you know, that significantly reduces the risk of the portfolio. It's not clear um, that's what you want to do. Indeed, one thing that we're going to talk about um, in some detail is this idea of tracking error. People know what tracking error is? Tracking error is basically the standard deviation of the difference between um, the benchmark portfolio return and your portfolio return. So if I've got an index fund that, that I invest in, it's got that tracks the Morgan Stanley Capital International World Portfolio, it's got a very tiny tracking error. Okay, the standard deviation between its return and the benchmark is very small. If I start taking bets, like in one quarter I'm 80% in cash, right, and then maybe I'm fully invested in the US the next quarter, I'm going to have huge tracking error. So that's something we need to, to worry about. And indeed, you can recast this whole optimization in terms of tracking error. But for, for what we're doing in the next couple of lectures, this can be very general. We've got a benchmark. We've got some information about long-term returns. We're going to optimize recognizing the limitations of this type of analysis. It's just telling us something about fixed weight strategies. We're going to optimize particular asset classes, countries, or sectors. Sometimes I'll talk about countries, sometimes I'll talk about asset classes, sometimes I'll talk about sectors. It doesn't really make any difference. The theory is the same. Indeed, you might even wonder what's international about all of this. Because the same theory applies for a purely domestic portfolio in the US or any other country. Same basic ideas. Okay, so is that 
Is that kind of clear? Yes, Prakash. Only in the markets where uh, there is rational behavior or uh, there are no uh, limitations on uh, trading, no trading restrictions. Because you take uh, a market like India where uh, liquidity and other issues come into play, then uh, that basically, you know, you can use this theory to uh, apply the stock market and modify the stock market. I can use this theory for any stock market in the world. But with any theory, you're right that how powerful it's going to be depends upon how closely the assumptions are kind of held up in that particular market. So in India, you've got a huge number of securities, 12,000 securities, half of which don't even trade once a year. So you can't think about doing the same things, given the extreme illiquidity in more than half of the actual individual securities, as you would like on the US market. So yeah, that, that's a real important uh, point for all the models that we do in this course, that you have to recognize when it applies and when it doesn't apply. We could do this exercise, no problem, or whatever benchmarks, and, and certainly people have developed um, kind of sector benchmarks within India looking at only securities that are liquid. And we could actually do this, make some assumptions on transactions costs and, and, and use it um, by kind of changing um, the data that we're actually looking at, not the broad market. Um, there are possibilities here. Okay, let's talk, uh, and I, I definitely did want to talk a bit about um, this question number two assignment number two. So this is our first exercise in actual um, forecasting. And I looked at a number of the assignments and I wrote down some of the forecasts for the next five and ten years, the S&P uh, 500. And indeed, uh, I've, I've blanked out on this. We were forecasting the S&P 500, not the premium on the 500, or were we doing the premium? Was it was the, the excess return on the 500, or the um, just the raw return? The raw return, right? The absolute, the, the absolute return. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and and I apologize to groups uh, in advance because I know that in a couple of cases, and I tried to write this down, um, some groups like we're overriding their models. They say, no, no, this is, this is wrong. We actually think the forecast is something different. So you, you might actually um, be in that group, but I didn't see it because I didn't have time between 10.15 and 10.30 this morning to, to figure out all the details. So let me actually uh, read through some of these forecasts, um, and then we can talk about them. So uh, BSP. And I'm not sure what that stands for even. It's not detailed. Um, their five-year forecast is 2.06%. Uh, and their 10-year forecast is 2.02% on the S&P 500. OK, that's an annual forecast. Um, uh, Fat Tail Dragon, that's FT Dam, um, that, their five-year forecast is minus 1.8% for the S&P 500. And then the 10-year is 0.6% uh, absolute return. Um, LT uh, AM, which I thought was long-term asset management, but is actually Looney Tunes <laughs> asset management. Uh, they've got a series of forecasts going from one to five. Um, and they range from 5.62% in the first year to 1.45% in the fifth year. And about the average appeared to be, you know, something a little above three. Um, S&P 500. Uh, they actually had a one-year forecast, and that was minus 2.65, a five-year forecast of minus 9.41, and a 10-year forecast of minus 4.5%. Now, they actually over, uh, they, they did the override. Okay, said, no, 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 something's wrong here. Um, so they used some judgment and suggested that the five-year forecast was 5.2%, and that the 10-year the, uh, forecast uh, was 6%, okay? and. I, I, again, I don't want to um, go into all the details, but we'll talk about this a little bit in the class. 
um, they correctly uh, recognize that maybe the dividend yield means something different today than it did um, just five or 10 years ago. Um, TBD, um, which is, um, I guess you haven't named your group yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, the five-year forecast, again, was a multiple um, going from you know, like one to five years, and it ranged from 6% to 2% in absolute return. Um, Sharp Mines Asset Management, um, and William Sharp, I'm sure, is pleased uh, that his name's associated with us, though we probably get an email from him pretty soon. Uh, <laughs> uh, they used a, a different uh, adjustment factor. Um, they actually came up with a five-year forecast of 3.56%, 10-year forecast of 3.24%. And then there was a group called Assignment to Write-Up, no group name. Um, and, and they suggested the five-year forecast was in around 8%, 10-year forecast 9%. And I think this was the one that, um, was this the one that was using the autoregressive um, kind of model, the ARIMA style model? I don't know. Um, and then uh, the last one that I got before I had to get mic'd up for the webcast, uh, was BTC, and their forecast for five years was minus 2.15% per year, and the 10-year was uh, minus 4.73. Uh, uh, and indeed, um, they, they also were, I, I think, a little uh, uncomfortable with those types of forecasts, but they, you know, they made a bit of a compromise and said that um, if, if, they, if they could adjust up a little bit, they would be quote, comfortable predicting flat growth, uh, minus 0.1% to 2% for the next five years. Yes? Just clarification, we are BSD. BSD. Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, B I said BSP. I'm sorry, BSD. <laughs> yes, BS and it's a pretty flat forecast, right? 2.06 uh, for five years, <laughs> 2.02. Okay, uh, and I know that I, I assume that I missed at least one group who's benefiting from all of this if it's not on the iDrive right now, uh, like big time. Um, did I miss, who did I miss? Nobody? Maybe there are only eight groups. We have, uh, we're putting, putting like, Speak up, uh, please. We have 3.51% for the five year. Okay. Sigma as the manager. Sigma, exactly, that's the one I was missing. 3.5 for five right. years? Right, and then 10 years, 1.5. 1.5 for 10 years. Right. Okay, well this is a cool uh, spot to start. We're, our first hands-on experience with forecasting, um, stock return. Does anybody do uh, bottom-downs statistical forecasting course? Yeah, did you do this exercise of forecasting the stock returns? Yeah. yeah, but over short term, right? <coughs> okay, this is different. We're looking at longer horizon forecasts. Okay, and uh, for the webcast students, uh, the data file is actually on the CD-ROM that you got by Federal Express. Two data files for kind of a five-year horizon and a ten-year horizon. Um, okay, well let's kind of look at the data. Um, and the main thing I want to talk about is the dividend yield. And what I didn't see a lot of, and again I couldn't go through all of the uh, all of the spreadsheets, but what I didn't see a lot of is you know, a lot of scatter graphs. Um, so I did a few scatter graphs. Hopefully this is legible. Uh, if you can't see this, uh, this is just average returns on the y-axis and dividend yield uh, on the x-axis. Okay, and uh, don't worry about the line that I fit through. I actually fit a, a cubic um, through the data. Uh, so it's just a regression of the five-year return on the dividend yield, the square of the dividend yield, and the cube of the dividend yield. I'm not suggesting that that's what you should do. I just fit the data um, using, using that model. And indeed, what we're most interested in, and in most of this assignment number two, is kind of extracting the information in the dividend yield uh, to see how useful it might be in actually forecasting returns. Now, Looking at this scatter, and if you're fitting a, a linear regression, it would be a straight line. So let's think of that as a benchmark because most of you did this straight line fit. And these are five-year returns. And if you just regress the five-year return on the lag dividend yield, so the dividend yield five years ago, 
and looked at the fit of the model, it actually looks pretty good. That thing comes in big time in terms of significance. And I think all of you have noticed that the dividend yield was a very strong predictor of the five-year stock return. Even when other stuff was thrown in to the regression, you were seeing a T statistic in the range of six. Okay. Now, some of you used overlapping data and some used non-overlapping data. Let me focus the discussion on um, non-overlapping data. Um, but uh, let me just tell you that if the data is overlapping, so you're using like five-year chunks just moving forward, the, the result of that is you're going to get severe autocorrelation. And some of you saw that already. Okay? And it's purely by construction. Because, in, because the overlap means there's some common periods. So an error in one period in the forecast is going to be carried through to the next uh, forecast. And that's why you get autocorrelation. And there's standard ways that are available to correct your T statistics for that. But one thing to realize is the forecasts themselves are OK. So they're not biased. The standard errors and the T stats are. But if we think about non-overlapping periods, it's real simple to do. And that spreadsheet that I, uh, I gave you, uh, I think had both uh, in it. Okay, so let's look at this data. So it's a scatter. Um, we're talking about five-year returns okay, for strategic asset allocation. And to see a graph like this is extremely good news. The R squared here is 30%. And let me tell you, when we do our tactical sort of exercise in assignment number three, you're going to be struggling to get 5%. And you'll be pleased <coughs> with 5%. And, and let me also say, tactical managers getting 5% are also pleased. You don't need that much. It's difficult to predict these returns on a month-to-month -month basis. But to get 30, that's a huge amount of predictability. Okay, so we're using quantitative model. We're looking at this data. There seems to be a sharp, positive relationship between dividend yield and returns. Okay, and as I said, I fit a, um, a quadratic um, or a, a cubic through this data. It doesn't really matter um, what you do here. Um, the issue is, what is the current dividend yield today? Very recollect? 1.2. So the problem is that our current dividend yield is like somewhere around here. So why is that a problem? Outside the data range. Outside the data range. way outside the data range. Okay, so we calibrate our model based upon these dividend yields and the average returns. We get a 30% R squared, and it looks like a pretty straight line. You know, it is true that there's more dispersion around the 2.5 or 3. But if I just fit a simple uh, curve through this, and let me do that uh, linear regression. It's going to look like that. It's as linear as I can draw. I guess it's a little bit kinked down. But we're talking a forecast from that single variable in terms of average returns of 2%. So it's saying, given the dividend yield today, and this is how to use these models on an out of sample type of basis. We fit the data. Given the history, get our coefficients, apply the most recent data to the coefficients today, and get a forecast going out for five years. This is an extremely risky forecast. It's, it, it is in the range where no person has gone before. Yes?
Okay. The, the wouldn't people jump? Wouldn't people always jump down? Okay. Your questions, like, involve it's got a number of dimensions. The first thing, let's set set all this straight, right? Um, we don't believe that markets are 100% efficient, or like indeed the, the value of this course would be greatly diminished. Okay, and we believe there's disagreement in the market, and we just hope, and I said this the first lecture, that we're kind of like, um, we're smart. And we're going to make some money. Because we're going to take a lot of data, put it together, and um, put it together in a way that's better than the people we're trading against. And I'm not talking about a floor trader. I'm talking about um, somebody making huge asset allocation decisions. Yeah, you're right. This is out in the market. And dividend yield is probably the most popular variable to predict stock returns. So it's kind of like two levels of your question. The first level is, you know, why are we doing this prediction exercise? Because the market's reasonably efficient, especially in the US. And especially you would think the S&P 500, where you've got futures and options trading on it, a lot of attention on the component stocks. You know, do we have any hope of achieving a dynamic strategy, so a tactical-like strategy, um, and a strategic strategy to beat some sort of uh, naive rule that just takes the average in the market? So to that part, I say, you know, we got to try at least. It's kind of like what I said in the first half. Are you going to walk away and just say, oh, it's a zero R square? Or are you going to try? The advantage of this course is that you're trying and there's no real money on it right now. So now is the time to experiment. Once you get out, and unfortunately the webcast students are managing a lot of money, <laughs> there's a lot more at stake. Because that's the first part. So we kind of believe that there is some level of at least disagreement in the market, and we're going to be smart in terms of the way that we put the information together. We're going to be very careful to try to maximize our to sample uh, performance potential. The other thing is that you're saying that given some reasonable level of efficiency, given that people use these dividend yields all the time, people are using the, the Gordon growth model, which you play with also in assignment number two, um, everybody can do these forecasts. Um, and it looks like the <laughs> forecast of return for the market is like really small. It's less than the T-bill rate. And it's less than the T-bill rate um, for the 10-year forecast too. So when I say you've got to be smart, there's different levels of being smart too. So some, some person might think they're smart because they can run a regression. Right? They've got a quantitative model that relates dividend yield to expected return. You run the model, R squared looks like 30%, this is fabulous. Um, you make a recommendation that you have to you know, heavily underweight or short um, the US market. But they might not have done this graph. Indeed, I'd be interested in seeing how many people actually did this graph. Because this graph suggests that we're out, of the, we're out of the range of the data. Therefore, the confidence that you've got in your forecast is just not the same. And it's not like we're just outside the range. And look what happens. Look what happens when you start getting um, to these low dividend yields. What is this called where the spread around the line is kind of not constant? It's kind of increasing? Heteroscedasticity? Huge heteroscedasticity in the direction that we don't want it. Right? If it was the case, it was the reverse, where everything was really tight to this line near the, the low dividend yields, that's, that's pretty good. But given that the, the dispersion you know, explodes near low dividend yields, and then you're going to take it down even further, you know, a full 1.5% outside the data range, you have to really wonder uh, if this is a reliable forecasting model. Yes. I mean, a lot of the bigger cap companies in the S&P aren't paying dividends. When you take those companies out, what's the R squared the data look like there? OK, so um, let's look at it this way. Today, 85% of the firms that trade in the US don't pay dividends. So what does this mean, dividend yield? This is like the remaining 
physically predict it for those remaining 15%. I've never seen actually anybody do that. And I know that some groups tried to make an adjustment for something like that, uh, which I thought was a smart idea. And indeed, it's a, it's a feasible exercise to do, um, to go and look at dividend yields for those remaining firms to see if there is a relationship between the dividend yield and uh, future um, you know, returns. But I've not seen anybody do that. So, <coughs> So why would the dividend yield be low? There's kind of like two reasons that you can think of it being low. Yes? Can our class asking why companies don't pay out dividends because they think they have better investments than the shareholders? So they've got very good growth opportunities. So they don't pay a dividend. And what's the other reason for not paying a dividend? Didn't make any money. <laughs> they don't have any money. And well, that's not maybe precise enough. Um, you could have good growth opportunities and you're not making any money. So the other reason is <coughs> not just that you're not making money. Tax reasons. Say it again? Tax reasons. Uh, it could be tax yeah. reasons too, but there's another good reason. You're, like you're in distress? Like you're really doing poorly. And you can't afford to pay out any dividend. So you got this group of firms that's, that is doing very poorly with the zero dividend yield. You've got other firms that have good growth opportunities with the zero dividend yield. You've got 85% of the firms not paying dividends. You've got a very low dividend yield. Yes? They must have had a huge increase in share repurchases as they went through capital. So that's the Sure. Like in the US, uh, this is a great example of that. So you've got share repurchases going on like we've never seen in history. So this is real important lesson for you in model building. And you know, I've got to admit that I kind of led you down this path on purpose. And I will not post assignment number two um, on the internet, okay? <laughs> will not do that. But there's like some fundamental differences between the data that we've seen in the past and the data where we're standing right now. Okay, share repurchases might be even considered a structural issue. We actually saw they're approaching the value of dividends as a whole. You take mm -hmm. all dividends and all share repurchases. So I mean, we just sort of thought that the dividends right. a very crude method. And if you do that, even if you do that, what's going to happen? If you double the dividend yield, it takes you basically back into the data, um, but right at the end. Where you've got big uh, dispersion. You'd have to adjust all the tasks, which is great. Right. But the repurchases really have only kicked in um, recently. So the historical adjustment is probably not going to make that much of a difference except for the most recent data. Okay, so we can uh, adjust for uh, repurchases potentially. We could look at firms that are just um, the ones, just the firms that are paying dividends. What else? Yes? I might be digressing here a little bit, but. How do you explain that there's all these repurchases going on at the same time we're saying that the market is overvalued? I mean, are all these companies making such big mistakes that you know, they're basically purchasing banks often and stuff that's overvalued? Well, who said the market's overvalued? Yeah. It's actually interesting. Um, the survey that, I, uh, that um, I've been involved with, uh, with John Graham over the years of the corporate uh, CFOs, um, that 90% of them um, considered their, 95% considered their firms undervalued in the market. And, and there's no incentive for them to, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to you know, mislead us, given that they're you know, filling this survey out. And it says widespread belief by the insiders that the market is undervaluing um, their firms. So we've not said anything about the valuation of the market, <laughs> other than if it's the case, if it's truly the case that the, and if I took the average five year return that you have forecasted amongst the assignments that I've seen, we're talking about 2%, 2% positive return, which is not that different than just fitting the simple regression line through uh, these data. Yes? Uh, 
Is the CFO likely to report that his company is overvalued? It's completely anonymous, including the facts. So um, we have a third uh, party fax house that strips off the header line. So uh, we're very careful uh, because obviously if the CFO is saying their, their firm is overvalued and that gets out, then it could be a problem because they are insiders. So they recognize that um, we've taken extra precaution through a third party um, and they also belong to the organization that's sponsoring this. So there's multiple levels uh, to ensure confidentiality. But he, even if he wasn't worried about the information getting out, won't they attribute the company's valuation to their own efforts? And, and uh, you know, they, they Are they biased? Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But to the extent of 95%, I'm not sure. It could be just fundamentally that they believe that um, their firms are undervalued. Which is fine. You know, it doesn't mean they truly are undervalued. It's just a perception of the managers. That's all we're measuring. Sort of some bias, but you know, more than half at least believe that uh, they're undervalued. Yes. But uh, if you cannot aggregate uh, individual CFOs' uh, valuation of the companies to the overall undervalued of the market because they may still believe that you know my company is undervalued, but. A lot of other companies are highly overvalued. Yeah, we certainly don't ask questions Especially about that. Especially competitors. You know, like Maybe. You know, I, we could ask a question about that, but that's uh, like a different matter. So <coughs> this, this uh, comment might still stand that the market could, could be overvalued. Well, the market, I'm not saying the market's undervalued or overvalued right now. Okay? Uh, if it's the case that these forecasts are the true forecasts, Okay, so I take your average forecast, which is the same as fitting a linear regression through the dividend yield and future stock returns. We're saying that the, the five-year forecast is roughly 2%. Yet we know we could get um, you know, over 5% <coughs> by investing in bonds. So what does that say potentially about the market, that it's Overvalued or undervalued? Yeah, it's got to be over, right? So you would think that the, the market has to come down for the future return forecast to be more positive. So these models, you know, that at least with the dividend yield, suggest that the market is, uh, is currently substantially overvalued. The lesson for today really is you've got to beware of these simple models, fitting data from, what did I give you, from 1947 or 51? 47? From 1947 to December 2000. You know, stuff is different today. It assumes a constant relationship. We already know, you know we, at the beginning, after the break, we already established that a low dividend yield could mean very different things for two firms. It could mean explosive growth opportunities, so we're not going to pay a dividend. And it could mean we just can't afford to pay a dividend because we're in distress. Our opportunities are so poor. Okay? We already figured out that there could be um, you know, other noise in the data due to repurchases which we have not modeled correctly. So the key thing here is this simple representation is not the sort of long-term forecast I want any of you doing. Okay? And a lot of it, you know, when you're an empiricist, uh, one thing I learned real early on, look at the data to correct for it. But still, a valid forecast, an unbiased forecast. So here's my forecast. 2% for the next five years. But compare that to looking at the data. All of a sudden, the first thing you see, uh oh, we're, we're out of the sample. And the second thing you see, the heteroscedasticity is exactly working in the wrong direction. The confidence that we've got in our forecast significantly changes. And then you start thinking the economics. So instead of just like um, pulling down a piece of information from data stream and feeding it into um, my regression, start thinking the economics of this. Okay, well, 
dividend yield, why should that be kind of like the only predictor of S&P 500 returns? And is it reliable as a predictor? And then you start thinking about building a model. So does dividend yield mean something different today than it meant 10 years ago or 15 years ago? That's the stuff that we have to do. Now to me, the, the dividend yield could be telling us something about expected returns. Indeed, I've used dividend yield myself. You, you will look at some of my papers and you will see dividend yield forecasting stock returns, especially in the short term. You look at some academic papers, you look at practitioner papers, you will see dividend yield. But to simply throw it in like this, it's unlikely you're going to see this. Actually, there's a couple of papers that, that actually do this. But they were published before the dividend yield went to 1%. They're within the range of the data. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do? Well, kind of the first thing that we can think of doing is, um, is looking at other data, so, and which you did. So I'll give you some other variables. And let's actually go through a few slides here uh, before we run out of time. Um, the first thing I wanted to show you is uh, if you really believe um, in this cubic model, this is meant to be only an example of what not to do. Let me make that real clear. So it looks pretty linear within the range of the data. But as soon as you start fitting these higher order terms, the squares and the cubes, that's what happens. So your, your forecast goes down when dividend yield goes high and, and up when it goes very low. It's not something, use this only if you have a really good reason to use um, a cubic. And I don't have a good reason to do that. There's also other stuff called uh, Fourier expansion, where you put sine and cosine and all this kind of stuff on the dividend yield. It produces something similar. Again, you know, you need a reason to do that. The, the most uh, comical one I've seen uh, was an arctan of an arctan. So you had two arctans uh, uh, with 17 different parameters trying to fit through the data. You know, again, it's a form of data snooping. You, you, fit, you get lots of curviness but the reliability of a sample is going to be extremely um, questionable. So that's the five year. Um, and this is the, the one year forecast. Again, fitting this uh, cubic model. And you can see that if we put a regression line through this, um, it's going to look something like that. So the one year forecast is actually below zero. Okay, again, we're, uh, we're we're still outside of the data when we do that. Next, let's look at the term structure. And we're proxying the term structure here with the uh, corporate um, uh, AAA minus the T bill. The reason I'm doing that is the historical data that I've got. Um, when we go back far enough in time, we don't have government bonds. But we always have this moody uh, AAA. We get basically the same sort of effect with that. And you can see here that there's a, a positive relation between the term structure and the stock returns. Again, I fit a nonlinear, a linear would, uh, would look more like that. Okay, and we actually documented in the very first lecture um, the idea that the term structure could have predictability in terms of future returns. And this is just evidence uh, supporting that with the 12% uh, R squared. Um, there's also the credit spread. And again, the nonlinear line through it looks a little crazy. One thing, when you fit these cubic uh, terms, they will, they will really hug the outliers. So if you got one outlier, the line's going to be drawn to it. Okay. And uh, if I fit a linear regression to this, um, the regression would look something more like this. Okay? And again, you get a negative relation here um, with the high uh, spreads indicating uh, low stock returns in the future. So there are some other variables here that could be useful in predicting returns. And, and what we need to do 
um, the next three minutes is to figure out how to fix this. Okay. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it. I want to be thinking about this throughout the course. Okay. First thing to me is that we need to separate out the pure dividend yield effect and the expected growth effect. It should be simple enough to go through and figure out the firms that have zero dividend yields because they're in distress. So if dividend yield truly tells us something about expected returns, then we need to be a little more careful in separating out firms. Because you can think of having two dividend yields in a regression, one for firms that are distressed, another for firms that aren't. You can think of breaking it up even further in terms of uh, growth opportunities. So you can actually have the dividend yield come in multiple times with multiple coefficients depending upon the criteria that you choose. Okay, the simplest one um, would be you know, some, some metric of, um, for example, suppose you paid dividend yields before and all of a sudden you stopped. So you pay dividends, you stop your dividends. That's, to me, bad news. But if you've not paid before and you, you're not paying, that's probably not bad news. It just means that you're getting your firm going and you're not ready to start paying out. So the life cycle of the firm, the life cycle of the industry, all of these things are really important. And it means that the relation between dividend yields and return could be firm specific or sector specific. So really, what I'm talking about here is we need to develop a way to model the coefficient that relates the dividend yield to the future returns. So that's step number one. Step number two is to add to that regression other variables that are reasonable explanators of future returns, such as the term structure variable, such as the credit spread variable. But that's only an example of two that I gave you for this assignment. It is also the case that those coefficients might be sensitive um, and change through time. We have to test that. So a lot of this quantitative model building is kind of testing the specification to make sure you're comfortable with it, because you need to make a forecast going out of sample. OK, so um, we actually didn't get to this, but um, the, um, at the beginning of the, the next lecture, uh, I'll do a bit of a survey as to what you think the return on the S&P is going to be over the next five years. Okay, and I will compile a histogram of that. Okay, my guess is that it's not going to be what was kicked out of your, um, your forecasting model. But I don't want to bias your forecast, which I guess I already did. Um, Got to think beyond the model. Okay, remember, the model is simply a model. You have to know when to override. You have to know if the specification is going to be reliable going on a sample. Okay. I personally, well, maybe I should advise the discussion. I should end it right here. But uh, think about what's reasonable going forward, because it's an important question how to get the strategic point. Okay? Um, also, last point. Um, I will put assignment number three up. I've made a few revisions in assignment number three. Um, nothing that's going to cause you to undo work that you've already done, but I assume people have not started on it anyway. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>